Intersections at Home. What happens when people from radically different worlds cross paths? Historically, many things. The civil rights movement, imperialism across the world, we know about these events. But how about right here, right now? I'd like to take you down the road to one intersection, that of class, just for a few minutes. I'm going to tell you a brief story, talk about current practices, and then explain what I hope will change. And as a disclaimer, I'm going to be speaking from personal experience using anecdotes. Please understand that my goal is not to make offensive assumptions, and so I ask you to listen if you can with an open mind. A few weekends ago, I decided that it would be fun to go downtown, visiting the bar scene in Clinton. When I finally made it to Don's Rock that night, I was distracted by social dynamics. Several girls had forgotten their IDs and were trying to convince the bouncer to let them in. He didn't seem too pleased with their whining, and after they eventually left, I saw him turn to his coworkers, laughing at the absurdity of these entitled college kids. His condescension was palpable, but when the girls were turned away, theirs was too. That same night on the Jitney, the bus that takes students back to campus, there was a similar phenomenon at play. This time, pushing and shoving filled the bus. The driver was frustrated and angry, and the two student event staff workers were visibly annoyed. They had been sitting on that bus for hours, chaperoning their intoxicated peers. On a surface level, maybe there's nothing inherently wrong with this picture, but let's dig deeper for a second. Allow me this assumption. Students who go to the bars spend money to go. And although the bars in Clinton are much less expensive than those in a larger city, there is both a financial and a time expense involved in going out. How about a second assumption? The students who are working as event staff don't really, truly, want to be on, all, on that bus with all of that loud noise and drunken antics. It's two o'clock in the morning. They look miserable. Now, I can't know for sure what the incentive is to take this late night shift, but I can imagine it might be a financial one. If these students start work at 9 p.m. and get out at 2 a.m., that's five hours of work they can get in during one night, probably about 50 bucks in total. So if I may, I'm going to claim that there exists a divide between those with an expendable income who can afford to partake in certain leisure activities and those who forego leisure for other things. And I'm also going to claim that by virtue of the intersection of these classes, there is a certain degree of animosity. Maybe it's not overtly visible, but that doesn't mean it's not there. Now, I'm not trying to say that this small window of experience was entirely dictated by class, because it wasn't. But it was one example of the dynamics between those in the service sector and those who utilize those services. We interact all of the time, yet is this interaction respectful? Is it one of mutual understanding? Is it dignified? I would like to leave you to answer that. But this story aside, I want to talk about what Hamilton would like to be. I want to bring you back for a second to Hamilton's main recruiting platform, the admissions office. Now, I think that admissions materials are a wonderful resource for prospective students. However, when the website proclaims something to be the case that to me doesn't quite ring true, I want to see this as a goal to strive toward. According to the admissions office's website, quote, at Hamilton, the quality of personal interaction that takes place in our classrooms extends to our residences, dining halls, and sporting venues, and the casual conversations that take place whenever two or more people encounter one another. At Hamilton, you can be yourself and be respected for who you are." End quote. To me, this place sounds like an amazing school to attend, but we need to make some changes within and around our institution in order to make this quote play out in reality. In reality, my friends have frequently told me that they try to write and speak the way a wealthy white person would and leave the accents, dialects, or languages they grew up with in order to acquiesce into the speech patterns of the upper class. At Hamilton, 
we walk into McEwen and see students of sameness sitting together. Perhaps this is just human nature, but maybe it's something we need to become a little bit more cognizant of. So what does happen when people of divergent backgrounds intersect? Potentially, conversations behind closed doors. Potentially, animosity. Or potentially, friendship. I'm not here to insult the many classes that exist within the Hamilton community, but this tension is something that cannot dissipate without our collaboration. So what I'm asking is that we continue to have community dialogues here at Hamilton, but let's try to hear some more voices. Is it possible to include the physical plan in campus dialogues? Or what would happen if every administrator held office hours at lunch, not just the president? And students, what's stopping us from communicating? Separate spheres divide us, and social divisions here only enable us to perpetuate these divides after we leave Hamilton. So the onus is on us to make sure that our home welcomes every type of diversity, not just the ones that are easiest to photograph. So what am I asking? I'm asking for everyone here to be intentional about closing class divisions in any way that you're able to. To know thyself, we must know the other too, don't you think? Thank you.